So as Penny just alluded to, we originally thought of this Sunday as a Selfie Sunday. Um, I know it's a silly name, I'm sorry, but you know, it's a cultural phenomenon, right? And um, we planned on, fo- I planned on focusing on the part of that passage today that says, you shall love the Lord your God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. The third part of this commandment to love that we hear in the passage today. And we're still going to do that, still have Selfie Sunday. Um, I want you, uh, I invite you, I should say, at the end of the service to come forward and stand here in the middle of the chancel and take a selfie. And what I think is really cool is if you take it at the right angle, you can take it with that stained glass picture of Jesus just over your shoulder. So you get a selfie with Jesus. (laughs) Which I know is kind of Silly, but it's kind of the point, isn't it? Right? But I also have to tell you that I ended up writing two sermons this week. Um, One riffed on the whole thing about Selfie Sunday. But then, unfortunately, Wednesday happened in our society. And nine people in Charleston, South Carolina were murdered. And it kind of puts the whole silliness of Selfie Sunday into perspective and made me rethink what I wanted to say this day. And I'm going to start talking about that event by telling you about one of the most painful and depressing books that I've ever read. It was called, Upon the Altar of the Nation, A Moral History of the Civil War. It's by a guy named Harry Stout, who is a professor at Yale. Um, I've read several books about the Holocaust of the Jews during World War II. I've read about 15 books about the genocide in Rwanda in 1994. I've read about the U.S. obliterating Hiroshima and Nagasaki with the dropping of the atomic bombs, about millions of Congolese killed by the Belgians, about maybe 20 million Russians killed by Stalin, maybe 30 million Chinese killed or died at least during the Cultural Revolution. And as disturbing as all of those books were, I read them all the way to the end. But I could not finish upon the altar of a nation. It was too depressing because it hit so close to home. Upon the Altar of the Nation is a religious history, basically, of the U.S. Civil War. It tells how Christians of the day understood what the Civil War was all about. Of course, both sides in the Civil War were Christian. The North and the South both believed that they were fighting with the blessing of God and in the name of Jesus Christ. In my view, both sides were blind to the true calling of followers of Christ to love God and neighbor nonviolently, as Jesus did through his death and resurrection. But more to the point today, the book is so painful and depressing because it lays out in detail how Christians in the South justified the enslavement of Africans, and why it was their duty to fight and protect their Christian way of life, as they described it. Through every conceivable form of communication, through personal letters of the day, newspaper articles, Confederate proclamations, political speeches, and sermon after sermon after sermon from Christian pulpits 
of the day, we hear people defend the position that the slaves from Africa were not fully human in the same way that whites were, and it was their right to own slaves as property, their Christian duty to keep them subservient, and their God-approved mission to fight to defend, to defend their way of life. Reading the original words of these people as the author lays them out in this book is so disturbing because they use biblical quotes, they talk about Jesus and the will of God, and they use examples from the history of the church. The book is so painful because they used our language, Christian language, to justify one of the greatest evils in human history. And that evil that was defended in that way still has echoes in our lives today. This matters, of course, because of what happened in Charleston, South Carolina this week. A 21-year-old white person, I couldn't decide whether I was going to call him a kid or a man. He walked into Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, sat down with a small group for a Bible study and prayer meeting, and then after an hour, he pulled out his guns and he killed nine people. Nine people. People. Human beings just like you and me. Human beings whose ancestors were slaves from Africa. People that we call African Americans in acknowledgement that who they are as people is shaped in part by the tragic, racist evil of our past. In some ways, it's easy to dismiss Dylan Roof. He dropped out of school in 10th grade. He was socially isolated and angry. He perfectly fits the stereotype of someone who at a young age, is already disappointed with life, having little hope about the future, someone who was looking for an enemy to blame, an enemy on whom to project all of his insecurities and fears so he didn't have to take personal responsibility for any of it. It's not mental illness, but immaturity and weak character that obviously led him to this horrible evil. It's easy to see what he did as the result of personal struggles and leave it at that. And as true as that is, that's not all of it. That doesn't explain what happened there a few days ago. Dylan Roof could not have settled on black people as the enemy without the racism that still echoes those conversations of the Civil War era, those echoes that are still a part of our society. It's been over 150 years since the end of the Civil War with its disturbing Christian arguments in favor of slavery, and it's only a fringe of the white racist supremacists who put forth similar arguments today, but the beliefs and fears and sins that go along with racism are not only expressed in words, but they linger still today in actions and priorities and decisions and habits that are part of our lives in this society. Even if no prejudicial word is spoken, 
Racism can still shape our political and social lives. Even if none of us are prejudiced against black people, we still are part of the terrible social machinery that creates racism and discriminates against black people. Racism is not innate. Dylan Roof did not arise from nowhere. This is taught, if not in words, then in the patterns of our society. It is taught in our almost entirely racially segregated schools and neighborhoods. It is taught in the way that some police view black young males. It's taught in hiring decisions and in access to health care and in commercials that treat whiteness as the norm and in drug laws and in the decisions banks make about giving credit to people. Racism is embodied in all of it and it's real and we are all a part of it. Now I don't know if this is difficult for you to hear or if you fully believe it and think it's taken me way too long to say it. I don't know if it's surprising to hear me say it or if every preacher of this church in the last 40 years has delivered some version of this message. I don't know if you will completely disagree or if you've been saying the same thing to those around you the last few days. But in any case, I believe it needs to be said. Racism is real, and we are all a part of it. But of course, we can't stop there. That's confession. And as I said earlier in this service, and as we say every week, confession is not the end, but opening ourselves up to the transformative power of God to change us is what confession is all about. So that's where we move now. How can we change? For us, I think it's a biblical question. First, I think we begin changing by right now, this day, five days after the, ta the attack at Emmanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church, we grieve. We grieve because those who were killed were people. People whose ancestors, yes, had their personhood denied for centuries in this land. But they were people. Our people. They were killed because they were people, just people in the eyes of God, the same as you and me, they were our neighbor. Those who sit down there probably at this very moment, our bells are ringing in the background, echoing the bells that are ringing in Charleston this day. Those people who sit there in that church in Charleston this morning and worship God with unspeakable grief and understandable anger, no matter the color of their skin, they are our neighbor, our brother and sister in Christ. As one suffer, all suffer together. We grieve with them. And then, with our grieving, as our scripture reading today teaches, we have to learn to love these neighbors as we love ourselves. Now the translation of that passage might be a little better in English if we realize that this is not a commandment that you love your neighbor as much as you love yourself. It's not like we have to build up all of our love of ourselves until we can love other people, but rather the translation is to love our neighbor in the same way that we love ourselves. And this gets real basic about our existence as human beings. How is it that we love ourselves? It doesn't mean that we have to like ourselves or think, wow, I'm really great. It has to do with the fact that 
at least when we are healthy and mature, we naturally seek our well-being as beings. We feed ourselves. We want what's best for ourselves. We want to be proud of ourselves. We judge ourselves rather easily most of the time. We give ourselves the benefit of the doubt. We don't think we are more important than other people, but we take care of what we've got. And what we've got is us, is me. You've got you. And so the point of Jesus' teaching is that we reach the depths of love when we can be as good to other people as we seek to be to ourselves. When we can see other people, no matter the color of their skin, as equally, equally worthy as I myself am to care and consideration and respect and value and love. And then we have to make that love real in our relationships and our society. We have to be willing to join the fight to change things. It is a fight that is played out in the personal realm of our lives, for sure. It's played out in the social realm, and it's played out in the political realm. And I'm not going to say anything today that is partisan and tells you who you have to support or how you have to vote or what you have to believe, but you have to be involved in this fight. We can't rest comfortably with just helping those who are the victims of racism. We have to work to end the racist habits and priorities and programs that sustain racism. We have to seek to understand them and to outsmart them and to undo them. Love isn't love when it's left at the level of personal interaction. Love is working to change evil when it exists in our midst. May God, this day, with those bells still ringing around us, may God help us acknowledge that we are part of the problem. May God be with us as we grieve our brothers and sisters who have been murdered. And may God empower us to change things. Only then can we Love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And love our neighbors, whoever they are, whatever they look like. Our neighbors as we love ourselves. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.